I'm Heidi Ergens, a sound healer, and I've worked with Meg for a number of years. Aligning your energies and cultivating your sacred path require unique ways of moving in the world. In this video, we'll look at Meg's experiences that put her on the path to wellness, wholeness, and transformation. So Meg, how did you become a shamanic practitioner? You know, Heidi, it really came from me following my heart and doing what I loved. When I was a young child, I got to live in the country and I had a, a place to play that we called the jungle. And I was just really happy in nature. And um, nature was my solace. Then as a young adult, I began to learn about organic gardening and that taught me about the interrelationship of things in the soil. And I learned to backpack and, and uh, that gave me courage and strength and a real connection with uh, the wildness of the mountains, the wildness of the world. But all of that time it was really very practical stuff, you know, hiking and backpacking and gardening. Um, so when I was 40, I adopted my daughter from Honduras. And after that, three threads began to confer converge in my life. One of them was um, my work with ceremony and ritual and the goddess. The second one was um, trance or what we call shamanic journeying. And the third one was um, beginning to go to the Andes uh, where I fell in love with the mountains and the people. So I had a teacher, my first teacher was Americo Yabar and he was a man who knew how to move energy. And the Carol people whom I met moved energy with ceremony. Uh, they moved personal energy, they moved communal energy, and, and they, they related to the whole world like that. What struck me when I was first in Peru was that the people I was around in the very high mountains were malnourished, they didn't have electricity, they might have a doctor wandering through, you know, once a month if they were lucky. They didn't have any of the things that we have, and they were happy all the time. They were spinning and laughing all the time, and I wanted to know how they did that. I had never met anybody, uh, never met anybody in my whole life who was like that, who was so joyous. So that, that curiosity of where does that joy come from, how do they do that when life seems so scarce, um, took me back and back. I visited uh, the Andes five times, the Andes in the jungle, uh, and I began to, you know, as I traveled more about the, around the world and seeing other indigenous people, I, I was always carrying this question. So I kept learning. So finally what happened is uh, a bunch of things in my life became very, very difficult. And I started out of desperation to use the practices I'd been taught in Peru uh, to survive and to, to release some of the incredible grief that I was feeling and to, to move through every day, which was, had incredible challenges. Um, so I started putting these energy moving practices to work and trying more and more to release heaviness and bring in lightness. And um, I just kept doing it. So after 20 years, I, I saw and my friends saw that I had begun this transformation that was really amazing from where I started. You know, the family I was given, the personality I was given, the, uh, all that stuff. And, and I had really been able to um, move away from that. Now the way shamanism in particular came in was that I was always a mystic. When I was five years old, I was kind of thinking about the universe and how could it be so big and what was that like? And uh, so I was always, not always, um, but when I, when I seriously learned how to do shamanic journeying, it was totally fun because I could inquire about anything in the whole universe and get answers to questions and and make a direct connection with my spirit helpers. 
Uh, so it all kind of converged and I just kept following my heart and I kept doing the things that seemed to feed me and feed my joy and feed the equanimity that I carried into the world and the compassion I carried into the world and in my family and so on. And what brought it all together for you? Well, you know, I had begun teaching workshops and doing energy healing work with people. I don't know, I'd been doing it for about 10 years and I thought, you know, I have a lot to say. I, I want to write about these amazing indigenous people. So I started writing this book and thought I was writing about one thing and began writing about, you know, saw what I needed to write about. And when I finished this book, which is called Living in the Heart of the Universe, Expanding Your Relationship with the Earth and the Cosmos, it wasn't until I finished it that I understood how much I knew. And I understood that I had taken it in. And I wasn't just parroting what somebody else said. So what brought you initially to energy healing and energy alchemy? You know, I'd done Vipassana meditation for a long time, so I knew how to be quiet and I knew how to observe. And I'd done a lot of therapy, so I knew the patterns I had, but I didn't, nobody said how to fix them or how to change. And I was really struggling. So that's where my Andean teachers were so important because Americo taught us all the time about how to move energy. And at first it was just kind of an abstraction to me. But when, when my life became more and more challenging, I started thinking, hmm, <laughs> maybe I'll try this and because the therapy isn't working, the meditation isn't working, or at least it's, it's not taking me where I need to go. They were perfectly good for, for what they did. So what I learned in my trips back to the Andes was the Carroll people who live at 15,000 to 17,000 feet and really were a very intact culture until the 50s when they came out of, uh, basically out of isolation because of the prophecies of 2012. Anyway, they, it became clear to me that they live in constant reciprocity with everything. They perceive everything as being alive. And so their whole lives are engaged with not just humans as alive beings, not just yamas as alive beings, but plants and stones and mountain peaks and rivers and lakes. So all the beings of their environment are alive. I mean, that's a very common thing in indigenous cultures, but we don't get to see it very often. Um, so I understood that that reciprocity was part of what needed to happen. And of course, that reciprocity is, is an essential part of shamanic work as well. Can you talk a little bit about the Karo's connection to the stars? You know, when you spend time with indigenous people who, with whom you do not share a language, you're present in the energy field, you're engaging in a ceremony with them, but nobody's explaining anything. And Americo was also not a teacher who explained things. He's, he's what we speak of as being on the left side, so he's not linear at all. He's, he's more the, the sulk of the wild energy. So I was spending the time with these people and nobody was explaining anything. So I was coming home and trying to figure it out and trying to put the pieces together all the time. And um, what emerged as I reflected more on about it and over time was that truly the relationship that with the Caro have with the stars is a is a substantive thing. It's not an abstraction like we might have in our culture. And I began to understand that um, their recipro reciprocity with everything is the source of their love and their vision and their power. And that was a profound, is a profound teaching for me. And it's one of the things that I'm trying to bring forth into the world. You call yourself a translator. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, as I was saying, when you're learning something by the seat of your pants and it's not linear, it's not mental, 
It's not handed to you in a book. It's oral tradition. Um, you're taking in whatever you take in. And somehow you have to filter it through your own culture to figure out how to use it. So the reason I use the word translator is that that's what I did in my own life. For example, um, when I was feeling really overwhelmed, I would release the heaviness to the earth over and over and over again and fill with the earth energy so I could just go forward in the day. Um, when my mom got anxious, I would tune into a tree that was outside her window and hold that connection so that I could stay present with her and not get, try not to get frustrated um, and be as much help as I could. When uh, my teenager was depressed and, and I had so much grief and guilt and fear and everything like you do when, when your child is not doing well. Um, I use the energy alchemy practices all the time to just release it and bring myself back to presence because my heaviness didn't do her any good and it didn't do me any good. Um, and that, that process over those years was, was really seminal in teaching me the power of moving energy and the power of um, intending to, to go from the kind of base dense stuff into the more refined stuff, which is what the Karo talk about all the time. They talk about hucha or heavy energy and sami or lighter or more refined energy. For a long time that was just kind of an abstraction, but when I was feeling it in my body, and releasing it and then finding some relief and finding some ability to um, be open-hearted, which was really what I wanted to do, be open-hearted and loving and present, um, which is sometimes all that you can do when somebody, somebody else is suffering. Those practices, that moving energy was what helped me to do it. So over time, what kinds of shifts did you see in yourself? It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't quick, but I developed the ability to release my despair and feel compassion. I developed the, some skill in uh, getting rid of feeling sorry for myself and being more present having a more open heart, being more present with the world. I moved from, from being stuck to really living in my heart and my vision and my sacred power. Um, and it's so familiar to me now, it's not that I'm Ms. Perfect or something, but it's so familiar to me now that I source my heart and my vision and my sacred power every morning before I get up and I refer to them when I'm making a decision. I don't just think, oh, I should do this, but I try to be in alignment with all those three things and in resonance with my, my deepest path in life. What is an example of a practice that you used? When I began having hot flashes in the night, for a while I would, like everyone, lift my blanket and air myself. And after a while I thought, I don't want to lie here feeling sorry for myself and frustrated. Why don't I use this energy uh, to feed my power? So I made up what I call the hot flash meditation, which I've shared with many readers of Sage Woman and Pan Gaia and other journals. It was simply taking in the heat and thinking, intending to feed my power, intending to feed my energy during the day. And what I learned, it was very funny, what I learned was I would start that meditation and in about two minutes I'd usually be asleep. So it worked and it was also setting an intent uh, to be powerful instead of being 
bullied by something that was happening to my body. So that was a really important piece. Um, another example was I began, sort of came from a lot of sources, but uh, I was working a lot with the mountains around San Francisco Bay, going to them, doing ceremony on them, taking my apprentices to them. And I began to develop this meditation that I call the Earth Cosmos Meditation, where you connect your energy with the cosmos and your heart and the earth, and you get a flow going, and then you acknowledge and connect with places you love. It could be a lake, it could be a river, it could be your growing up house, it could be a mountain, it could be uh, Chomalungma, Mount Everest, it could be anywhere. But I, I built up that meditation, and again, I used it at night often. I would wake up and be twiddling my thumbs in the middle of the night, and I had to get up and go to work. So I would start doing that meditation. It was incredibly calming. It made me feel so happy because I was thinking about all these wonderful places. And just like the hot, flat, hot flash meditation, it was so calming that I would often fall asleep. But I began teaching that to people, and, and other people found it very powerful as a... Um, a way to maintain connection. So I guess the, the third example, the third biggest example for me is the elements meditation, which um, I, I had learned part of it, releasing heaviness to the earth from America, you know, a very long time ago, but I hadn't thought of using all the elements, uh, and somebody tuned me into that idea, and I started working with it, and I found it such a wonderful simple way to release and fill with what's around us all the time. I mean the the breeze is blowing right now and I could stop talking to you and just let out my nervousness and take in the cooling breeze and I'm set to go again. How do you set boundaries? Yeah boundaries are an issue for almost all my clients. People want to be open-hearted and generous and they end up taking in everything because they haven't developed any way of uh, filtering. So I developed some really simple boundary setting and protection practices which involve intent. Um, and the intent is, uh, you actually say every day, I intend to take in what's appropriate for me and keep out anything that's not appropriate for me. So you don't, you're not controlling everything, but you're setting up a line that says, if it's not mine, it can stay away. Um, and you can also use uh, a visualization like creating an energetic bubble and filling it with blue light like the Chumash people did in Southern California or filling it with white light. Whatever you need to remind yourself that you have that boundary. And once you set the intent with the boundary, it's much easier to remember it. Uh, so I want to read something from my book about intent because it really explains um, what I mean and how it's different from our English version, which is intention. We use intention all the time. Intention has a definition of willfulness and making something happen. If I intend to get a new job, I'm going to get one. That kind of energy and intent is different. By intent, I mean that which arises from your whole being, your body, mind, heart, and spirit, the light and the heavy, the sunlight and the shadow. Intent includes the energetic attention, passion, spirit, and direction you choose to focus on as you move through your life. True intent takes into account your weaknesses as well as your strengths so it doesn't set you up to fail. Acting with intent sends an energetic vibration into the world, feeding what you are trying to create, personally, politically, globally, and affects the cumulative outcome of things. Finally, what's your vision? Well, first of all, I believe you and everyone can step into your love, vision, and your sacred power. Uh, I believe you can discover your essence and find your inner authority. And as you do that, 
you're more able to take care of yourself and you're more able to help others. So how would someone else use this? In my experience, practicing energy alchemy helps you step into the untapped power and potential of your energy body. It helps you step into the largest story you're capable of living, getting beyond your small self into connection with everything that is. How can using energy alchemy help other people transform? I teach what I use myself because I know it works. I mentor you, help you heal, teach you energy alchemy practices, and do whatever is necessary for you to step onto your true path, to find your inner authority, and to live from your essence. So how do you tie this all together? So my vision is that energy alchemy and shamanic practices offer you a path you can follow to heal yourself and the earth and to create a resonant future for our descendants. If this vision appeals to you, I invite you for a free consultation. We'll talk about your intent and how I might help you on your path. You can find out more at megbeeler.com.